Hey everybody, welcome back to this channel and this series where I go through random RPG products that I have and give you uh, an idea of what they're like. Quick flip through and review. In this one, um, one of my viewers, Sergio, asked for a review of Castles in Tillin, and I'm happy to oblige because this is my favorite mega dungeon that I own and, and I think my favorite that I've ever run across or, or certainly played. Um, Castles in Tillin is written by Gabor Lux. Now, it's not the biggest mega dungeon you're ever going to get. It's much more, I would say, reasonably sized. And what I mean by that is you can you can not feel bad about buying this and starting a campaign of it because it's you're going to be done with it before you're tired of it. Which is often my problem with big mega dungeons is that I find that my players and I get tired of them before we're really done with them. This is not the case. It's a mega dungeon, so it's not small but it's not the biggest dungeon you're ever going to see. Um, there is an element of replayability to it, and I'll talk more about that later. And there are lots of secrets to find, and so if your players are dead set on, on, a, on completing this, it would take a while. But you can play through it, have a lot of fun, and be done with it in a reasonably, you know, a reasonably sized campaign. And I think that's a real strength of a mega dungeon, honestly. Some of these mega dungeons that are so big, you're never going to run them. It's just, it's almost, it's just like a vanity piece, right? I mean, like, you have it to say you have it. And I know that there are some people who run those dungeons, but most DMs, GMs, are not going to. Most tables aren't going to play those games. This is reasonable. It's one of the reasons I like it. It's also the most fun Mega Dungeon I've ever run across. Everything is fun. The NPCs are fun, the, the locations are fun, the random encounter tables are fun, the set encounters are fun, the sorts of things you're running into in the dungeon are fun. Even the death traps are funny, often. Um, you're running into things like animated hats that bite your head off, you're running into giant pigeons from hell, you're running into uh, you know animated mimic pillows that are going to bite you if you sit on the bed. Uh, it's just excellent. I think this is a great dungeon. Gavor did an incredible job with this one. Um, now, as I said, it's not the biggest dungeon in the world, you can see. But as, you, as you'll as you get a sense, um, it's actually, you know, the, the pages are quite big, and the dungeon itself has multiple levels, and it's not it's not small. So don't worry about that, you're getting your money's worth, um, but it's just not massive like a lot of other dungeons are. Um, it's for swords and wizardry, that's the system, but you can use it with any old school system. I've run this for... Um, I've run this for Maze Rats, I've run it for Shadow Dark, I've run it for Five Torches Deep, or parts of it. I haven't run the whole thing for each of those systems. Um, I'm currently running a, a group of players, younger players, through it with uh, Shadow Dark. So we started with level zero characters, we started it as a gauntlet. And then um, the characters who survived, not everybody survived, because it's deadly. It's a deadly old school mega dungeon. Um, the characters who survived, uh, the players who survived rather, no, characters, <laughs> the players all survived. The characters who survived, the players got to pick the ones that they liked. And then those became level one, and then they, they're they entering into the dungeon. So um, I'll give you, again, a quick quick flip through. Now, when I got the book, it came with this, and it also came with this envelope with um, extra maps, uh, or rather the maps for the whole system. And you could give these to your players. Some of them are blank. Here, for example, I'll show you guys. This is the blank map of the main floor with the walls already... Um, already filled in for you. So everything that's visible from the sky, essentially. Because one of the ways you could approach this dungeon is to climb up onto the roof. It's not that big. And so you could climb up onto the roof and go around and drop down in the various places that you want to. Or you could go around, swim through, and come to the garden, or circle around this way and come up onto the balcony behind. Um, I've had players approach this through this main break in the wall. I've had players go through the front door. I've had players circle all the way around and go up to the balconies. But players come all the way around here, swim over to the drawbridge, throw grappling hooks up onto it, go up onto the drawbridge and start at the tower. Um, I've had players climb up onto the wall here, climb up onto the building, go down, go all the way to this side of the building and then rappel down into the second story windows on this side of the building. So I've just had players go at it, you know, almost every which way and every single time it's been fun. This is the main floor, as I said. Um, now what I would do, and this is what I did for my players, is that I scanned this um, and I just printed it out for them. So I don't want them drawing on this, but I want them to be able to draw notes and maps on this. So I just scanned it and printed it out so that they could have it at the table. And they've been doing that. They've been filling it in as you go. Then there is a version of the map which has all of the rooms filled in with room numbers and brief descriptions of the room. Um, 
that's for the DM. You wouldn't show this to the players, probably. Um, the back sides of those also have this other floors. I'm not going to show you guys that um, right now. And then there's the blank um, upper floors uh, with the towers um, and then the blank dungeon level and the section for notes. All right, so that is, um, those. that's the extras. Those are the stuff that just comes with this book. Um, the book itself has a lot of that stuff in the back. Now, remember what I said about um, Barrel Maze and other dungeons like that, and the Mega Dungeons, and that you kind of have to print off your own maps and have them nearby? Well, this one gives them to you um, when you get the book, at least if you buy it in physical form. Um, so you don't have to worry about printing them off yourself unless you want your players to have something they can work on. Um, that's really great because it solves the problem of having to have a map on every page. Now, I wish it still had that. It doesn't have that. Um, so in that respect, it's, it's similar to the other books that we've looked through. Um, now, one thing about the art in this book is that for the most part, it's really good. Some of it's kind of like clip art. You can see that it's taken from, this is not, obviously, this is just a, a good piece of art, um, a great piece of old school art. I love that color cover. But a lot of it is uh, clip art. I shouldn't say a lot. Some of it is clip art. And so that just takes it away a little bit from the, uh, you know, from the originality of it. But for the most part, it's, it's great. Um, so this is great. The front cover is a map of the first level. And all of the um, people, all of the players, or should say characters, who died in the dungeon and, and where they died. And then you can look at the, uh, this next page. Or the next page is the introduction. But then you can look at the past the forward. And you have the Hall of Heroes, and these are all of the characters, the still kicking section, are the characters that made it through. And then you have the Crypt level, which is every character in the playtest who died, and where they died and how, often with a little kind of funny note. It's great. It tells you a little bit. And you can also look at this map as a brief, quick glance and see where things are that are deadly. Okay, something deadly is over here. Something deadly is over here, right? Something deadly is over here. You can get a quick overview of where things are tend to be deadly because a lot of characters died here, a lot of characters died down here, a lot of characters died over here. And then the same thing is true on the back. Let me open that up. Uh, but you have the uh, other levels of the dungeon. Something really deadly is in the tower. Something really deadly is down here. And again, right? So you get a sense of where people, characters have died in the dungeon uh, at a glance. So you know if players start to head over there, uh-oh, something's dangerous. But there's obviously dangers everywhere because there are dead people all over the dungeon. And then there are people who got lost in the dungeon, which is one of the mechanics that if you run away, your henchmen, if they run away in battle, uh, they roll on the table and very often they can just disappear. And so there are some characters who just ran away and never were seen again. So as I said, the system is swords and wizardry, but it's old school, super simple stat blocks. You can run it for any system. I've had no trouble uh, adapting. I haven't played it for swords and wizardry, actually. So I can't say how it runs exactly in the system it's built for. But um, I, it worked great for Five Torches Deep. It worked great. It's working great for Shadow Dark really, really well. It worked great for OSE, uh, really, really well for Maze Rats. Just so far, it's been great. OK. Um, so one thing that's interesting about this world, this is, see, this is a great piece of art, but it's taken from elsewhere. It's not drawn for this book. It's a piece of clip art, I think. Whereas this is drawn for this book, uh, and art like that. Uh, same thing here, right? This is, a, I think this is a piece of clip art, or maybe not clip art. Well, maybe it's drawn for this. It has the artist's name on it, so I'm not sure. Regardless, it's set in our world, or like a fantasy version of our world, sort of. Like, there aren't any dwarves, as far as I can tell. There aren't any elves or halflings. Every character in the town of uh, Tourzon, Tourzon Savoy, or Tourzon, Tourzon Savoy, I don't know how to say the town name, <laughs> um, is a human. And all of the NPCs you run into the, in the dungeon are either human or undead or things like that. Um, it's sort of assumed that you're in our world. Like Charlemagne is mentioned, Roland, the, the famous French knight, is mentioned. Um, the, uh, the Holy Grail is mentioned. There's like bishops. There's reference to the King of France, and his name's L. I don't actually mention what his name is, but it's obviously, obviously Louis. Um, so again, you have this idea set in our world, sort of at the in the Swiss cantons or like the French uh, cantons. It's like right on the border between France and Switzerland, basically, is the idea in this town of Tours en Savoy. Uh, Chambrose is nearby, which is a real city. So you have a, uh, you know, that I like that because it feels way more grounded. And so therefore, like it's, it's the fantasy elements stand out when they're compared to our world. Like, you know, Roland is a real guy from history. Um, the Count Roland, who died at the Battle of Roncevaux in history. Um, and in this, he is the County Roland, and he's mentioned, and, uh, you know, his, his sword, I think, or something like that is, is you know, something related to him is, is um, a magic item and found in here. 
um, because in, in the in the Song of Roland, the poem from the uh, from the 11th century, um, Roland's sword is Durandal, and it's this powerful enchanted sword given to him by saints. Um, so you know that idea that the the history of the world with its magic uh, and the folklore it's all real. Yeah, that I like that. I like that vibe. So that's what we find in here. But you, you know, I haven't ever run it in our world for any of my games. It's always just been a generic fantasy world, sort of. And you know, elf, elves are in there, and, and halflings and dwarves and stuff. So it's not impossible to just add those in. Um, there are tables for rumors, and I like I like these. They've all been great. Now there's uh, rules for um, morale and henchmen, and then there are random companion quirks. So this is for henchmen that you hire. You're going to roll on the table, and they're going to have some random quirk. And sometimes it's like. You know, they, they lie about their experience that they've had in the dungeon. But sometimes it's like they are actually a secret member of the secret police and they're here to catch somebody or something. And there's some really interesting ones. Sometimes they're way stronger. Sometimes they're way weaker. Um, like the number one, it just has a bad leg. Um, the art in this book, for the most part, again, aside from that clip art, is great old school art. If you know Gabor Lux's products, it's all kind of in this style. Really good. Old school, but grounded. Uh, not high fantasy so much, um, which is my preference. I'm not. I'm not never a big high fantasy person. Um, and then there's a table of random curios, things you can, you know, random trinkets you can find, and that's great. I like table books with these things. Now, one of the things that I always do, because I've run this now as a gauntlet. I've run this as a level zero adventure for DCC. I forgot about that. I ran it for DCC, or I guess I, I kind of mixed DCC and Five Torches Deep just for the uh, level zero funnel. And I've run it as a Shadow Dark Gauntlet now. And all of the level zero characters, I give them a quirk. So that way there's something that stands out about them. And sometimes it's really good. Like uh, they can start with an extra, like a magic weapon. One guy started with a plus one sword, I think. Yeah. Um, other people, um, you know, are alcoholics or things like that. <laughs> so it's just, it's a totally random thing you can give to your level zero characters. Um, now the level, the level, the guy who started with the magic sword died. Uh, very tragically in the dungeon. It was quite fun, actually. Um, okay, so then you have advice about how to run the how to run the dungeon, and castles and Tillin itself. Uh, what the you know how to like when you come upon a door, uh, when you come across the different family members, the different family portraits. One of the, the things that's happening in this big old ruined castle that it's basically this old family estate, the Malavols, um, which is a great evil name, right? Malavol. Um, they're the you know this ancient French family. Who has been going? They've gone back all the way to Charlemagne, and they had this castle up in the mountains, uh, on the shores of this lake. And slowly but surely, over generations, people have added to it. They've built onto it. They've dug under it, and so it's this sprawling, you know, eclectic mega dungeon. This house, castle, you know, <laughs> everything. And uh, there are, while it's officially abandoned, the current on the book's owner doesn't live here. He's a Malibu. He lives in, you know, Chamrose or something like the, the big city nearby. The house is still not empty, but it's full of treasure and full of, you know, legends about things being hidden there, including perhaps the Holy Grail itself. Um, and so people come to find it and they loot this basically quasi empty house, but old family members are still there. Some of them are living. Some of them are pre-deceased. Some of them are post-deceased, right? Um, and so you can run into this, and this is what I meant earlier when I said that the, uh, well, th th this is one of my favorite dungeons to run because it's really role play heavy. It's a mega dungeon, it's old school, but I would say about a third of the random encounter tables are specific named NPCs. Now, some of them are fights and they're dangerous, but many of them have things that they want, quirks, personality traits, and relationships to other NPCs. And so when you run into them, you are not just running into a random encounter with a bunch of ghouls, although that's also on there. You can run into just a random combat encounter with ghouls or ghosts or various things. But uh, a lot of them are actual people and they have locations in the house where they're sometimes keyed, and so you can run into them there, or you can run into them as a random encounter. And either way, they will be interesting, and they will have something that they want, or you'll roll on the, uh, you know, the, the um, how they feel towards you, right? The, uh, the uh, what's that called? I forget what that table's called. Um, where you encounter a random encounter, and then you roll on the reaction table. Thank you. <laughs> Reaction. I don't want to, I'm saying thank you to myself. The reaction table, and uh, and so you could have you know this vampire 
because there are vampires in here, who is friendly. And he's interested in the NPCs doing something for him. Or the, the PCs doing something for him. And very often, you know, you can run into him right when you enter at level one. He's just by the door. And so this is a very dangerous dungeon because it can end up in, in a TPK very easily. But it can also be you run into a vampire or a lich and you're like, hey. And he's like, hey. And then you just kind of have that like, okay, I guess we're not fighting you. Because the family isn't, dis like, they're not defensive of the house unless you start killing a bunch of them. And then there are rules for how they can start to work together and against you. And I think that's really cool. So you can start to help them or hinder them. And there are ways of kind of tra keeping track of how friendly the family is to you. Um, and, uh, and then there are some family members who are obviously just going to be hostile or helpful, regardless of where you run into them. So there's a, a great, that's a great element. And also there are portraits of all of the family members on the walls of the mansion throughout the mansion and you can run into them. And they're like Harry Potter animated portraits where they can talk to you and tell you things and try to hurt you and try to do things, but interact with them. So there's a ton of built-in role-playing in this, in this dungeon, which is excellent. And it's so different than a lot of other mega dungeons where you're looking at fight after fight. Now, again, there's plenty of fighting, plenty of combat. It's obviously a lethal dungeon. You can see that from the uh, playtest deaths and the, uh, and my own experience is that I've, I've had tons of, of player character deaths in here, tons. Um, in various ridiculous ways. Um, getting destroyed by an animated hammer, getting eaten by um, uh, ghouls. Uh, one guy got trapped in a mirror of life trapping and then they shattered it to try to free him and that kills you. Um, one guy got petrified. Um, uh, a, one guy threw a crow-like glaive, like one of those crow weapons from the movie. And he rolled a one, and it says explicitly that if you roll uh, badly enough, then it can attack you, and it hit him and killed him. So he threw his own and killed himself by throwing the glaive, and it returned and, and killed him. Like, there are ridiculous weapons like that throughout. Uh, and ridiculous ways of dying, and I love it. Uh, but it is old school in that sense. So you've got great art that is described. Uh, each of them, you have the grounds. Um, and it's divided into sections A, B, C, D, etc. And so it's, it's easy to... Um, to find where you're looking, uh, because again, you have on the map, um, the map is labeled with those sections. Now let's see if I can find a quick the map. Here it is, yeah. So here's the map of the whole dungeon. Oh, this is the first level. And the sections are numbered. So like the grounds are A, and you can see it's A, well, I don't know if you can see it, but it's A2, A3. So it's easier to find than just, you, you look for the letter and then you look for the number you're looking at. So it's fairly easy to find your way through this dungeon while you're navigating, but it would be nice to have those maps on the page. Um, I would say that's the main thing that I'm not so keen on about this dungeon. But everything else in it is really, really fun. There is an element of whimsy, which is my favorite. I love that. Now, I, you know, there are maps. They're just not on every page. So sometimes you have to flip a bit, um, but it'll show you the map of the region that you're in. And that's, that's good. You don't have to flip to the very back of the book, but you do have to flip a little bit uh, from time to time. Great gruesome art sometimes. Um, now, one of the things you're going to have to be okay with is whimsy. As I said, whimsical uh, jocularity. Like I said, there, like here you see them. Um, there are, if you can see this picture, giant pigeons from hell that devour the party, like breadcrumbs, if they go up into the towers or they spend too much time on the roof. And I think that's hilarious, but not everyone's going to like something like that. There are, um, as I said, there's an animated hat that if you put it on, it bites your head off or tries to. Um, there is a, a room with a bunch of mimic pillows. If you lay down on the bed, the pillows try to devour you, which happened to one of my characters. He got devoured by mimic pillows. Um, you've got a tower with a perfectly preserved sleeping beauty, or I would say more like Snow White. She's in a glass coffin. And if you open it, it's not so much a princess as a ghoul who wants to now eat you. Um, but it's great because it looks super fairy tale and she's locked in this high tower and you get up there and then she tries to eat you. Um, there is a lot of just great jokes and joking encounters, but um, there's also a fair bit of violence and death <laughs> and that whimsy that goes along with it. Um, there are a few places where I would say it's a little bit more adult I don't know if you saw some of the art already, but it's a little bit like that um, in a couple places, which means, you know, if you're going to play with younger players, like I have some younger players um, in my group, uh, in the group that's running through it, you just have to, you know, change your descriptions a bit. Um, 
if if you uh, if you feel that's necessary. But it's it's easy to do. It's not like an essential part of the dungeon or anything like that. It's just you know that kind of humor or that kind of encounter. Um, and so just you know know your players. Also, it's a fair bit of gruesomeness. And again, if your players aren't keen on that, then you know maybe you're not going to want to run this dungeon because it, it can be gruesome. And uh, and uh, the descriptions of people being devoured or the descriptions of the uh, dead bodies are sometimes kind of scary for a little, again, younger um, players. Or if, you just, if your group isn't of that type. And again, like I said, if you're, if you're playing a much more serious game, there's a, basically a, a beast, um, like Beauty and the Beast, although he, is, and he loves his rose, and he contemplates the rose and uh, has a tragic story. Um, my players just wrecked his section of the house. They looted everything they could find and then they hid from him and then got away. It was great. Um, if your players are, are not interested in the sort of whimsical, ridiculous side of things, I, I shouldn't, this isn't like Gonzo, right? You're not talking about absurd stuff, but you know, there's a gambling den with skeletons playing in the basement. There's a room full of skeleton ex-soldiers that are singing drinking songs and marching songs, and they're drinking, and the alcohol is slipping through their, you know, uh, down onto their their bones because <laughs> they can't actually consume it, and they don't notice. Um, there is a pirate-themed room where there's a pirate who talks like a yar pirate, right? If you're not okay with that sort of thing, you're not going to like this dungeon very much because uh, that's the whole tone. You have the chanson of the Grail. And uh, it actually gives you clues as to how to find the Grail in the dungeon. That's sort of the ultimate, um, the ultimate uh, treasure of this dungeon. It's very hard to find. You have to kind of go to the four corners of the dungeon and gather seemingly innocuous things, although they're not innocuous, they're magical. And, and uh, if you know the chanson, then you'll know you're like, kind of what you're looking for. And there are a couple NPCs. One of them's very dangerous, one of them less so, um, who know how to open up the rooms to the grail and then there are tests it's a really cool part of the dungeon it would be kind of like an end game you could make it you could make it the theme of the dun the adventure right like you have been told that the chanson is here or the, sorry the grail is here you know the chanson now there's an interesting little place towards the end called the indoorness uh, instead of the wilderness or it's the indoorness and it is this recur, it's this infinite, well, it's not really infinite, it's like a small globe because you go off on one side of the map and you come back on the other. But it's a place inside the dungeon that's bigger than the dungeon. Um, and so you can, it's a, it's a wilderness uh, point crawl. And there's stuff happening out there and some of the big bads are out there and there's some magic items out there that are really strong and stuff like that. But it's basically one of the ways to, uh, one of the places you can explore is a, out, a wilderness a point crawl within the dungeon itself. And there are different ways to get there. Um, and you have the rules for the indoorness, um, which I think is awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and also has some jokes out there. So now here's the rogues gallery. Here are the characters. And as you can see, they're labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It goes like that because these are also the random encounter tables. You roll a D100 when you have your random encounters. And sometimes you modify it. It'll say add 60 to the roll. And that's what you roll when you're just going to go for monsters or like a, a combat encounter, non-NPC encounter. Because the first one through 60 are just named characters. And it talks about them and gives you a description, and it has sometimes chances of things, a one in three chance that this is true, a one in three chance that that is true. What they're carrying, what magic items they may have on them, what they want. Um, it would be, you know, the, the information is fairly short. It would be a little bit nicer if things were like indented with, you know, a little bit better organization here, but it's fairly easy to read. It's not horrible. Most, it has their alignment, which is really helpful because most of them are gonna, be chaotic um, or undead or something like that, but there's a handful of lawful ones and a handful of ones that are interested in helping you, um, if you help them, perhaps. Um, and then once you get through 60, then you start to have uh, the staff, right? So you have one through 60 are the rogues, <laughs> the, the family members, and then you have the staff. These are just extra creatures, um, creeping vines, um, you know, just a random uh, goatrices. Instead of cockatrices, they're cockatrices, but they're goats. Um, and then you have the treasury, which are all of the random or all of the magic items you can find in, find in the dungeon and where they are, what they do. There's a brief description of them in the room too, but if you just want to give a, at a glance, you can see all the magic items. And then the map um, of the dungeon. Uh, there's the Scintillan ground floor, and then you have the uh, upper floor, the maze of the occult, the gothic wing one and two, the lake tower, the dungeon tower, 
uh, and the upper quarters, the family's house. And then you have the dungeon level and the Endornis, which are out here as well. You have a great piece of art here. Uh, and then you have oh, closing information. Uh, and uh, basically about other stuff that um, the, uh, the uh, publication company does. And then the legal appendix at the end. Great last little page. So as you can see, this is an excellent little book. Um, it has a lot of information, a lot of cool dungeons. The entries are brief, but they expand. Um, and it is just one of those delightful dungeons that is... I mean, it's not terribly modular. You could take particular NPCs or particular rooms out, but you could do that in any dungeon. This is really much mo more coherent and cohesive. It's one house or it's one place, even though it's kind of got these weird eclectic parts where you have the, you know, the, the old lab and then you have the, uh, the gothic, you know, vampire's quarters and you have the skeleton's servant's hall and you have the larders, you have the tower, it's kind of fairy tale tower. And, it's, and so it's all very eclectic, but it all fits together with the idea of the family and the family members having their each little domain and the places that they've built or that they've inhabited since then. And it has that kind of um, one family residence feeling. And I really like that. Once my players started to recognize that there were people here, living and dead, that could be interacted with and that knew each other and that had domains and things, it just it changed the entire feeling for them. They came in and they were like, all right, it's going to be a big house that we loot and there's going to be traps and undead. And then they ran into their first talking ghost. And he was like, yeah, I don't like this guy. You should kill him. And they were like, wait, did you want us to kill another NPC? Yeah. I was like, I don't like him. He's annoying. And they're like, oh, all right, great. Okay, so now we have factions and things going on. And suddenly they realized it was much more, uh, much more than just this big, random, spooky house. And for Halloween, if you like kind of a whimsical, spooky house with undead and stuff, this would be a great one-shot to do with low-level characters, level zero characters, a gauntlet to do on Halloween or, or over, uh, you know, the days of Halloween. Because it has a little bit of spookiness, but like, you know, very, very light. It's just ghosts and, and undead and uh, vampires and things um, with some, you know, bloody footprints here or there or some laughing voices down the hall or, you know, the creeping vines that try to strangle you. D&D &D level spookiness. But it has a, an underlying element of fun and of ridiculousness that I think is great and essential for a, a really good table experience. So... I highly recommend this book, Castles and Till, and if you can pick it up in print, you should do so, uh, if you can get the maps especially, but the PDF is also great, um, has all that stuff there, and um, it's either way going to be a, a worthy addition to your collection. So great suggestion, Sergio, thank you, and um, this is a great book, you guys should buy it. That's all I have for this one, hope you guys enjoyed it, I'll see you in another one, see ya.